what's up guys? Uh, this is 15721, Advanced Database Systems at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I'm Andy Pablo, the, the professor for this course. Uh, as I said on Piazza, um, right now I'm in Reno, Nevada with the TA, Lin Ma. Um, we had to take care of a bunch of stuff for um, some money issues, but whatever. Um, so I can't be on campus right now, but I still want to you know, get the first lecture started um, and start talking about with you guys about you know what the, what the course is going to get be about and get you know get the ball rolling on on the sort of the, the main topics. So for today's lecture, um, I'm going to start off talking about the, the logistics of the course, um, what's going to sort of be expected for you guys as 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 the semester goes on, and then we're going to start jumping into actually start talking about the the the, the topic right away. And that's going to be in-memory database systems, which, which, which is going to be the focus of this, uh, this semester. And then we'll finish off talking about some, some interesting, early, notable in-memory databases that I think are worth talking about a little bit. But they're not, we're not going to really focus too much on them during the semester because they are not as widely used as the ones we'll be, we'll be later be talking about. So to jump in really quickly, uh, to help sort of motivate why I think you should be take this course... Um, the main thing that I, I say every year is that the, uh, the, the there's such demand for people that can build database management systems, right? These are complex pieces of software, um, and there's a, so a lot of unsolved problems that people have to deal with in this area. And frankly, industry and, and academia cannot hire fast enough in this area. So I would say that if, if you're good enough to actually write code in a database management system, which is I hope you'll end up being by, by the end of the semester, um, then you'll be trusted to write code in almost any other type of piece of software. So whether you're, you know, you're, you're building an operating system, but in some kind of embedded device, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today in, in this class are going to be relevant to other areas. I am also a little proud too also about the success of, that we've had in having people that take this course go off and do other great things. Um, so this is just sort of a list of some of my the former students in this class and, and our research group who have gone off um, in industry and are, are now building some of the, the most interesting state-of-the-art database systems that are, are available today, right? So, you know, I don't want to name names, um, but, you know, these are some of my best students that have gone off and, and done great things. So, again, if you get through the course, you, uh, you know, if you're able to follow along with everything we're talking about, uh, you, you can go off and do great things at, at these places as well. So, the... The high-level objective about what this course is really about is to help you understand the how people build modern database management systems. Right? What are the system programming techniques that you need to you know, build high-performance software that's actually able to, to you know, process lots of data? So my goal is that for the end of the semester, you'll become proficient in the ability of writing you know, correct and high-performance low-level systems code. But beyond just doing that, the goal is also that you end up writing, you know, documentation and test cases for everything you write along the way. And so it's also going to give you a lot of experience in working in a large code base with a with a team um, and understanding the how to, you know the things you have to do to get along and work in a big piece of software with a, a large group. So that means doing code reviews. That means and writing documentation and specifications about what we're doing. So it's more than just, you know, we'll do this, we'll describe these techniques and the concept of databases because that's what I care about in my life. But the, you know, the higher level of things, again, can be applied to other areas of computer science or when you go off in, in your career. So the main topic of the course will be about the internals of, of in-memory database management systems. And specifically, we're going to focus on single node systems. So these are databases that are going to be deployed on, on, on one machine. So we're not going to talk about distributed databases at all in this class. Um, and this is primarily because this is not what my research, in research interest is right now. But a lot of the same techniques and concepts that or we talk about for a single node system can then be also elevated and applied to uh, distributed environments. So it's not, you know, even though we, we don't talk about distributed databases, doesn't necessarily mean everything we're going to do is is could not be used in these things. The way that I like to think about it is that if you, unless you have a, a your single node system is actually able to work really well and correctly, going up and you know scaling out and being distributed 
which just make you, you know, is not going to magically make your system be better. Like you're going to have other problems that you have to deal with as well as the single node problems. So another aspect of this course is that we're going to focus entirely on state-of-the-art concepts and techniques. So that means that this is not a course on classical database management systems. We will mention system R, we will mention ingress, but we're not going back you know, to the annals of database systems uh, literature and looking at how they built systems in the 1970s. We're really focusing on how people are building modern systems today. Right? The, the sort of classic database system architectures, uh, you know, those are the kind of things you would cover in an introductory you know, advanced undergraduate course. And that's that's not what we're doing here. This is this is this is very uh, cutting edge. So the kind of things we're talking about through the, through the semester are going to be concurrency control, like you know, how do you run transactions running uh, at the same time or queries and running at the same time and updating the database. We're talking about modern uh, techniques for doing indexing, storage models, compression, uh, join algorithms, networking protocols. Again, these are all the things you need inside of a database management system to actually be able to run in, in the real world. So we're going to focus a lot, uh, sort, sort of go step by step and describe the architecture, how to build out the full system. And so the goal again would be end of the semester that you would understand, be able to, you know, all the different components you need to build out a full system. So in the background that I expect you to have in order to take this course is that I'm assuming you've already taken some kind of introductory course on, uh, on database systems before. So if you were at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, then this would be 15.445 or 6.45, or again, any other sort of introductory course at, 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 your, at, at your undergraduate institution. So the reason why you need this background is because you need, when we start talking about things like join algorithms, I'm going to assume you understand how to do the classic implementations that uh, are described in textbooks, but now we're going to talk about how to do this in, in, in modern hardware setups. Right, with you know uh, parallel cores and, and vector vectorization uh, instructions and things like that. So that means the things that we're not going to cover is how to write SQL, how to do uh, serializable theory for transactions, relational algebra, the, again the basic algorithms for joins and data structures for, for indexes, things like that. Again, I'm going to assume that you have you understand all these things, and that way we can jump right into the the, the more advanced topics. So the, for the course logistics, I'm going to go over real quickly what's expected for you during the semester. Um, the course policies and the full schedule is available on the course website. And the one reoccurring thing that we're going to, we're going to have uh, as I go along in this introduction is, is asking you not to plagiarize because this is a really big, big deal. If you're unsure what it means to plagiarize or not plagiarize, uh, you can go look at the CMU policy page uh, that they have for the university. Or if you're really unsure, just ask me, because I'd rather have you ask me than, you know, is it okay for me to copy this piece of software that I found on the internet that solves the problem I want to solve, right? Ask me first before you do anything. And that way we don't get to the issue of, of, of you know, did you plagiarize or steal something that you, sh you shouldn't, take something that you shouldn't have taken. So again, if you plagiarize in this course and we catch you, we will report you. And it's just the way it is. I have office hours during the semester on Monday and Wednesday, the one hour before class. And this will be in my office in uh, 9019 in the Gates Midhoman building. Um, so whatever you want to do, whatever you want to talk about, we can, we can talk about implementing the projects. We can talk about uh, the papers that you're reading and discussing them. We can talk about how to... What? What? Hold up. I, I don't... What do you want? Who are you? I'm here for my money. What are you talking about? That face Rick sent me out here and said he had my money. I have... I have no idea what you're talking about, I'll be honest. You're lying. You have my f***ing money. I don't even know who you are. You piece of shit. Yes, you do. You know Fat Face Rick, right? I know Fat Face Rick, yes. Good, then you know you have my f***ing money. Give I, it to me. I don't, lady. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Give it to me before I have to f*** you up, man. Hey, look, you're crazy. I do not have your money. I have no idea what the f*** you're talking about. You owe me $200 I don't owe you I need that money right now. Your student Lynn is inside the casino talking to Fat Face Rick? Yes, I know Lynn, yes. He said you're out here in your car doing some stupid database thing. Yes. And Rick told me to come out and get it from you, so where's my f***ing money? I have no idea what you're talking about. Give me my f***ing money. I'm, Are you gonna give me my money? I'm not gonna give you anything. I have no idea what you're talking about, lady. $200. That's really Get the away from me. Sorry. Are you gonna give me a I'm not giving you anything. 
Yeah, Reno is kind of kind of crazy. Um, I don't know what she wants. I have no idea who that is. Um, right. All right. So, uh, yeah, the um, the TA for the class, Lynn. Again, he's in the casino right now with with Fat, fat Face Rick. Um, that's weird. Anyway, he's awesome. He is smarter than I am. Uh, he's the lead architect for all the self-driving components we have in, in the system we're building here at CMU. Uh, you can go talk to him if you have questions. All right. Uh, the, for the course, uh, what's expected of you are, are, are the following five things. Reading assignments, programming projects, two exams, and then an extra credit. So let's go through all of these. So for every single class, we're going to have a mandatory reading. Um... And on this, on the schedule on the website, there'll be a little star next to it. Right, this is what you're required to read. And for every every reading, you have to write a, a, a short synopsis, uh, just five sentences that describe what the paper is about. And you have to do this before the class. And you'll, there's the link there you can submit online to the Google form. Again, the idea here is just that you read the paper before we go to class, and that way. Uh, that way, you know, like you, you can ask questions that are about the technical aspects of the paper and not the uh, and not ask like trivial things. So the the synopsis needs to have three sentences that it, that pr provides an overview of what the main idea of the paper is about. Then you talk about what system that they used for the evaluation and how they modified it for their experiments. Uh, and then you have a one sentence to talk about the, what the workload they used, and how they evaluate it. And the idea of that last sentence or the workload is that. When it comes time to do your final project, you can then go and say, all right, I, this paper described the thing that I'm working on, and I know how to go, uh, I know what workload they use, so I'll, I can do the same thing. So again, please do not plagiarize these. Uh, if you cannot just find text on the internet and just copy it in there. You can't copy from your friends. Uh, if we can, we catch you plagiarizing, we're going to have to report you. So the... Other major part of the grade, or actually the bulk of the grade, is going to be on the, the programming projects. Um, and so in the old versions of the course, we had a system called Peloton. We were building at Carnegie Mellon that all the projects were based on. In, uh, in this class, we, we threw away all the code, and I'll describe this later on, but we're starting out with the... She's back. What? Look, I don't have Are your you money. Give me my I'm not giving you money. I'm I don't with the... Ah! All right. <laughs> that was, all right. Uh, that was that was all right. That was that was. Um, yeah. So uh, the 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 first programming project is going to be on our new system, as I said, and the this will be done individually. And the idea here is that we're gonna you're gonna everyone's gonna work on the same part of uh, the the system for our project. And you're gonna learn how to 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 build out and optimize a uh, this one of the pieces of the storage component, um, and then we'll teach you how to do profiling and you know running val grind and perf and call grind to to understand where the bottlenecks are in the implementation and how to improve them. The uh, <clears throat> the the third project will be uh, sorry the second project will be a group project of three people, um, and this is where you're gonna pick some topic. Uh, that is relevant to the things we're discussing during throughout the semester, and you're going to implement that in in this this system. And the idea is that you know this is the bulk of the grade, so the, for the course, so this is a uh, so we have significant programming effort on everyone in, in in the group. And obviously, that you know you can't have two groups working on the same thing. Um, so the the final topic, I think that you're going to be able to pick, will be has to be approved by me. But I'll of course obviously propose a bunch of different ideas of things you could pursue. So we don't have to worry about this yet. Uh, we'll worry about this later on in the uh, after you come back from spring break. Uh, of course, again, same thing. Please don't plagiarize. You can't just copy code off the internet. If you're not sure, please ask me. Um, so more than just you know writing a programming project and throwing all the code at the end uh, for this final project, the, the project two, that it really is about. Uh, going through the process of building a piece of software in an existing system and having it being able to be usable by other people. 
So at the end of the day, you just don't turn in your code and get a grade and you're done. There's going to be a bunch of steps along the way of things you have to turn in to, uh, to, to prove that you've thought through and understand what you're actually proposing to implement. So there'll be a proposal part where you provide a specification about the, your, your, your project, how you think you're going to implement it. And then there'll be checkpoints along the way until the end of the semester of uh, things you'll need to provide about the show that you're actually making progress towards your, your proposal. Um, there'll be code reviews where you'll have to be assigned to another group and they'll, they'll review their code. You'll review their code, they'll review yours. And then you have to address their requests. You have to do performance analysis and rigorous testing to prove that your implementation is working correctly. And that would be a final presentation at the end of the semester to, where we sort of have a party and everyone can talk about the things that they actually implemented. The last piece, though, is very important, the code drop. So the way it works is that you won't get a final grade at the end of the semester unless your code can cleanly merge into the master branch. Right? So it doesn't mean you just go fork our code and make whatever changes you want. It actually, be, actually has to be able to put, be put back into the, the full system. Because right? again, this is part of the engineering effort of, of working on a, on a real system. So the I would say our success rate of projects in previous semesters that have merged, being able, we, that we actually took from the class and merged into the master branch has been about 50%, So, which I think is actually pretty good. So about 50% of the projects end up being something we put into, into the full system. So that would be a, uh, a lofty goal for yourself. There's two exams for the class. There's a midterm exam that'll be uh, in class on March 6th. And then there'll be a final exam that's a take-home exam that'll be given out on the, the last day of classes. Um, again, I'll, I'll have more information about what the what's expected of you on, on these exams as, as we get closer to them. The last piece is a extra credit assignment. So this is completely optional, um, but if you want to uh, sort of 10% boost in your, in your final grade, there's a, uh, you can write an article for this encyclopedia of database systems that we've been building here at CMU, um, where you basically pick a system that no one else has studied before uh, at CMU, and then you write a Wikipedia style article about it with citations and attributions for, and you know, the information that you collect from it. And that's sort of different than what we're doing than what Wiki, how Wikipedia does things is that Instead of just having freeform text in the, uh, you know, in, in describe what the system is doing, it's actually structured. So you can say, you know, they're doing their the concurrent scheme they're using is two phase locking with deadlock detection, and here's how it's actually implemented. So this is the third semester now that we, that we've done this, and so these there's still many systems people can pick from. Um, and the way to think about this is like if you pick an obscure system that may not have a lot of information. It's going to take you more time to find that information, um, and so that's that's you know that's one effort. But if you're doing a system that's widely used and well known, then the expectation is that you have to be very thorough um, in 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 your uh, in your article. So again, this is entirely optional. This is extra credit. Uh, this is something that uh, again I'll I'll just discuss more later in the semester. And again, please please do not copy anything. Uh, in, in this extra credit article that you're writing. Uh, if you copy things from Wikipedia stupidly and we find out, and you again, you will be reported for plagiarism. You just can't copy text from other people thinking that they wrote it better than you could, and so therefore, you know, you, you'd be dishonoring them by copying it. Do not copy, do not plagiarize, okay? All right, so again, the breakdown for the semester is as follows. The reading views, again, are due every, every class, and they're 10% of the grade. Project one is 20%, project two is 50%. And of course, that means, again, 70% the final grade of the course is for the programming projects. Um, and the midterm and final exam are each, uh, uh, each 10%. So there's a, the course mailing list is, is entirely on Piazza. So please use this if you have any technical questions about the projects. Um, if there's deeper conversations you want to have about personal issues or other problems you may be having, please don't post on Piazza. Uh, but you know, send those directly to me. Again, the idea is that if you have a question about something in, in the course, in a, in a programming project, I post it on Piazza so that everyone can see it. Don't send personal emails because that way we don't get, we don't want to have people emailing the, you know, sending the, the same question multiple times. 
The last piece is I want to thank uh, SAP for uh, sponsoring the course and helping out with course development. Because of them, we have uh, been able to hire an extra TA that's going to help us actually write the, uh, the, uh, the, the lecture notes and hopefully build out something that's uh, better than what we had before. So again, we're really appreciative of them. Uh, we're going to have somebody come at the end of the semester and give a uh, guest lecture about the uh, SAP HANA, which is their in-memory database that they've been building for a while now. Um, and we'll see as we go along, there's a couple papers that will, will come up that are from the SAP HANA team that are relevant to the various topics that we're talking about. All right, so uh, with that, the that's the overview of the course. Let's now get into, I guess, the course material, actually the, the meat of things. So um, I want to sort of start off by talking about in-memory databases and sort of describe what makes them interesting and unique and why we're actually going to spend the entire semester talking about uh, databases in the context of MMA database systems and how it may be different than what you have learned in a introduction database course. So when you look at the history of database management systems going back to the 1960s, um, a, a lot of it, it has to do with with the, the systems having to overcome with the problems of, of or the deficiencies of harder resources. Um, and so a lot of the, what I call traditional disk-oriented database systems, their design is predicated on assumptions about the harbor that, you know, that, that have existed way back then. And so when you take like an introduction database course, in some ways it is most, you know, most introduction database courses, it's, it's, it's sort of tailored toward architectures that were developed back in the 1970s, right? When the first database systems like System R and Ingress were, were first created. Um, and the hardware that they had back then looks a lot different than the hardware that we have, have today. So in particular, like back then, there were these giant monolithic machines that had a single, single socket CPU with a single core, like a unit processor. Um, the amount of RAM that they had was extremely limited. Uh, we're talking like, you know, in kilobytes. Um, and because of this, you had to store the database on disk, right? If you want to be able to store anything of, of meaningful content for an application, you had to go to disk because RAM was just too small and too expensive. And, but, you know, disks were significantly slower uh, than they are today. I mean, they're slow now, but it was even worse back then, um, especially, you know, if you're dealing with mechanical devices and not like solid state storage. And so they the architecture of these systems is really predicated around having to deal with moving data in and out of, of slow disks. So, but where we're at now today in, in our, our current state of the state of affairs in, in hardware is that DRAM has gotten large enough and cheap, cheap enough where most databases can fit entirely in main memory. Um, I mean, certainly there's going to be outliers. There's, you know, there's data warehouses there's, there, that, are, that are in the petabyte range that you wouldn't want to put in, um, you know, in, in, in entirely in DRAM. But most structured databases are small enough in the orders of, you know, gigabytes or low terabytes that you could actually fit it in a, uh, in a, in a database system that was entirely main memory. It's the, when people think of like big data, really, really large data sets, a lot of times these are going to be what are called unstructured or semi-structured databases. So unstructured would be like an image. Like I said, you know, Facebook has a repository of all the photos people have posted. That's unstructured data, right? There's no, like it's just raw, you know, the raw bytes of the images. You can't really run queries on them directly. Semi-structured would be like log files generated from web services or applications, right? That they're like sort of human readable text fields. And you can obviously convert them to be structured, um, uh, but then, you know, it's, it's, a lot of times you just sort of leave them as, as they are. So we're going to be focused on, on the first one, the structured data sets. And, you know, these are things that people normally think of, like when, when they think about databases. And so these are going to be things that, for the most part, will be small enough to fit in, in main memory. So before now we get into discussing what an in-memory database looks like, you may be thinking like, well, I took an introduction database course. I know about, uh, you know, how, how those systems are designed, uh, disk systems are designed. 
and they have a buffer pool that they can use to cache pages that they fetch from disk. So if I'm saying that most of the database, most databases could fit in main memory, couldn't I just give this uh, you know, traditional disk-oriented database system a really large buffer pool cache, and would that be sufficient to get the kind of performance gains I would want from in-memory execution? And so the, to understand why this is not the case, let's now discuss what it actually a disk-oriented database means. So the definition I like to give for a disk-oriented database system is one where the primary storage location of the database is going to be on uh, non-volatile storage. So like a spinning disk hard drive or a solid-state store drive, a flash drive. And the means that the system is going to assume that anytime it needs to read data, that data is not going to be in memory. It's going to be out on, on, on disk. And therefore, the architecture is predicated on this assumption that like, at any time you do a you know, read for a tuple or a read for a page for, for any, any piece of data, that's not going to be in memory. And therefore, you're going to have to go out to disk and get it. And so the way the database is going to be organized is through what are called slot of pages. It's just a way to pack in uh, tuples into a single page. And then as we, as we get the data that we need from disk, we'll bring it into our in-memory buffer pool that's the act as a cache. And we have to do this because we can't operate on the, the data directly on, on memory. Every, every time we, or sorry, directly on disk. We always, always have to bring it into memory and then process it or do whatever manipulation that we want on it. And then we can write it out, out to disk. So the database management system architecture in some ways is, uh, it's designed to, to move this data back and forth from disk into memory and to ensure that anytime I try to read something, if it's not in memory, then I know how to go out and get it. So the, again, the, the core piece that's going to do all this for us is the buffer pool. And again, as I said, when a query goes accesses a page, maybe to read a tuple, then the data system is going to go check to see whether that page is already in memory in its buffer pool. And if it's not, then it goes out the disk, copies it into a frame in the buffer pool, uh, which is sort of a free location that, that can store some page, um, and then hands off that 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 pointer to the to whoever whoever asked for that page, so that they, they can do the processing on it. Of course, now the tricky thing is that memory is finite and and limited, so we may be the case that there's no free frame for the for our new page we want to bring in. So then we got to run this eviction algorithm to decide what's the best page for us to remove that's going to be the least likely to be used again in, in the near future. Of course, now, if we choose a page to write out or to, to evict from our buffer pool, and that page has been modified by another transaction, then we can't just drop it, right? We have to then go and actually apply that change out back to disk. So then once we, we've done this, we find our, our free slot, our free, or sorry, a free, a free frame, we can put the, the page we want in there, then we can update whatever uh, whatever indirection layer that we have to translate the on disk location to the in memory address for that page. So let's visualize see, see what this looks like. So let's say that we're doing a query that's going to do a lookup on an index to find a particular tuple. So we traverse the index, and we reach the bottom of the leaf node, assuming it's a B plus tree, and we're going to get a pointer to the tuple that we want. And this pointer is going to be a page ID and a, and a slot number. So in order to translate this page ID into, and slot number to an actual member location uh, that we can then access for that page, we have to do a lookup on our page table. This page table is basically a mapping from page IDs to frames in our buffer pool. And so let's say in this case here, uh, when we do this lookup, we, we see that the page we want is actually not in memory. It's actually out on disk. So that means that we have to go bring it, copy from the disk, and bring it to the buffer pool. But right now our buffer pool is is filled up, right? We only have three frames. Everything is being used, so we have to make a decision on which one we want to 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 evict to pull it in. So during this process, we have to take a latch on the entry for our page in the page table to make sure that nobody else comes along and tries to to do the same thing that we're doing at the same time. We don't want somebody else to say, "All right, I wanted this page. It's not in memory." It's on disk, because let me go also try to go fetch it in separately. So let's say now we run our eviction algorithm. This could be, be some variation of clock or LRU, or we decide that this is page two for whatever reason is the one that we actually want to evict. But let's say that page two is actually dirty, like it was modified by a transaction. 
All right, so then we got to go make sure we write out its changes out to, to disk. Then we can then remove it. And of course, we've pinned this, we've, we've taken a latch on this frame to make sure that nobody else tries to do the same thing we're doing at the same time. Once page two has been evicted, then we can go copy page one into it uh, and then update the page table to now point to this. So then now anybody that comes along and may want to do the same lookup on page one will see the memory location in the buffer pool that has the data that, that they want. And then once we're done with everything, we can release all our latches. So the key thing to point out here, and again, the, the question we're trying to, trying to solve, or tr question we're trying to answer is, if we just give the database system a lot of memory for a large enough buffer pool where we never have to evict anything, is that going to be, would that be good enough for, for us to get good performance? And the answer is going to be no, because of all of those steps we had to do just to see whether the, the page we wanted was in memory or not. And this is what I was saying in a disk-oriented architecture, the system is makes the primary assumption that the, 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 the primary location of the database is on disk. So it, it doesn't think it, the thing that it needs is going to be in memory. So that's why it always goes through the page table to see where it actually is, is located. And you take latches along the way to make sure, again, you have you don't have issues of other threads trying to do the same thing at the same time. So it means you're always doing this translation from, from the record ID to the memory location, and you're pinning things as you go along, right? Even though everything could always be in memory. And the reason why they do this is because just because things fit in memory now, they don't know, you know, tomorrow you're not going to come in and, and load in a bunch more data and things start getting swapped out to disk, right? So think about it. If I, if I had a machine with 100 gigabytes of RAM, uh, I give 100 gigabytes to MySQL, I load a 90 gig database that fits entirely in main memory, MySQL is still going to treat it as if it could swap out the disk because it doesn't know that tomorrow you're not going to come in and load another, you know, 100, 100 gig, gigabytes of data. So now, as part of this, the, the next issue we're going to face in a disk oriented system is its is concurrent control scheme. So again, concurrent control is the protocol the system uses to allow uh, sim transactions to run simultaneously or queries to run simultaneously and, and modify the database at the same time without causing um, logical errors in, in, in the database. So in these older disk oriented systems, they, the concurrent control scheme was sort of designed that they because they assumed that at any time a transaction that could be accessing a, a piece of data, that piece of data could not be in memory, so, and it had to go out the disk and get it, and therefore that thread would have to stall. So what they want to do is they said, while one thread stalled going to do disk I.O., they can allow other transactions to run at the same time, uh, assuming that their data is in memory, and allow them to still make forward progress. And so the way they're going to do this is that they're going to set locks and other uh, constructs that will provide the asset guarantees from transactions. And because this, these locks had to be stored in, in, you always want these to be stored in memory so that you can always keep track of what transaction holds what lock on what data, these locks are being stored in these separate data structures, these separate hash tables, to avoid them being swapped out the disk. And we'll see later on when we talk, talk about in-memory databases, since they... Tuple, a tuple may not be swapped out to disk. Uh, they can actually store the locks in the same location as the data, and that reduces the number of lookups you have to do to go see whether you can acquire a lock on something. The next bottleneck is going to be the logging and recovery mechanisms in the system. So again, from, from the intro course, a disk-oriented database system is going to be using the steel no-force buffer pool policy. Steel means that a page that was modified by a transaction that hasn't committed yet is allowed to be written out to disk. And no force means that they, when a transaction commits, you don't have to flush all the dirty pages from the buffer pool. And so the way they implement this is through the write-ahead log. So the tricky thing with the write-ahead log is that because that's getting flushed out to disk separately from the data that, that's been modified in the database, right? So the, the write-ahead log contains entries about how transactions modify pages. And then the, that, those log records can get flushed out. And then the, the, the database pages that were modified that correspond to those log records, they can get flushed out separately. Because now you have these sort of, sort of uh, separate mechanisms for how things are getting written out of the disk, you need to keep track of the, whether the log record that modified a page, whether that's been written out to disk first before you're, you can write out the, the page that was modified first. And so the way they do this is through log sequence numbers or LSNs, 
So, the, so this concept of LSNs permeates all throughout the system to make sure that they know what log record mod what what log record was responsible for modifying what page, and what and what how far in the write ahead log data has been written out to disk. So, of these these sort of three three key concepts. Um, the question now becomes of, of which of these is, is going to cause the most slowdown in a disk oriented database system um, for an in memory workload. And so they, there was a study done from the HDR project, which I was a part of when I was in grad school back in 2008, where they measured how much time was being spent or how many instructions were being uh, spent or executed for these different components of, of a database management system. So this was done on a disk or in a database system called Shore, which is like a early storage engine out of the University of Wisconsin. Um, it, the way to think about Shore is like, it's like Berkeley DB or Rocks DB. Like it wasn't a full SQL engine, but it had a core storage manager. I mean, it had all the features you would expect from a modern database management system. And then they instrumented the code to allow them to measure how much, how many instructions were being executed for different parts of the system for a database that fit entirely in main memory. So they, they, they gave the system enough RAM, they loaded it entirely, uh, the, the entire data set into the database system, and they, then they ran uh, transactions on it and measured how much time would be being spent in the different parts. So the categories are going to be the buffer pool management, the latching, the locking, logging, and, and uh, doing comparisons of the B, the B, B plus trees, keys. And then the last piece will be the amount of real work being done. So the actual the work being done to actually execute queries. So what they found is about 30, 34% of the instructions were spent in the buffer pool. Right, this is the part we talked about of doing the lookup in the page table, setting uh, latches along the way to make sure that you're protected. Another 14% was the time we spent in uh, latching mechanisms for the internal data structures of the system. So think of this as like, again, going doing a, uh, taking a latch on the lock table in order to execute transactions. 16% um, of the instructions were spent on the, lo the locking mechanisms. 12% of time was spent in the logging, so preparing the LSNs and the log records. And then about 16% of the time was doing comparison of, of the B plus trees. So this leaves us only 7% of the, the total time left over where we're actually ex doing real work to execute queries, um, which is it's not a lot. So the way to think about this is that all of this, these other parts that aren't the seven percent, these are the parts of the data management system you have to have uh, because you could assume that any time the database system, the database or the data you need to access is not in memory, is that, is that on disk? And so this is why we have to start over from scratch. This is why we uh, want to build a new in-memory database management systems that don't assume the data is on disk and therefore can take advantage and apply different optimizations. Um, uh, because we know everything's going to be in memory. And that this, this sort of pie, pie chart really lays out what the whole point of this course is. How do we actually uh, make that 7% be much larger by assuming data is in memory and ex execute things more efficiently? So an in-memory database is one where the system assumes that the primary source location of the database is in memory. So as I said before, this means that when a transaction or query does a lookup and says, I want this tuple, the system is not going to assume, oh, that thing's out on disk. Let me go prepare to go fetch it from disk. It says it's in memory. I, I, I know I, I can go access it efficiently. And so this is going to allow us to make a bunch of different de design decisions uh, that are going to be optimized for this environment. So in-memory databases aren't new. Uh, they go back into like the 1980s. There was a lot of early work done at the University of Wisconsin um, on building the sort of first prototypes of, of these types of systems. In the 1990s, we'll see in a second, they, some of the first commercial in-memory databases came, came about. But it's really probably been in the last decade that these types of systems have, have really started to take off. And as I said, this is because the, the price of DRAM has dropped enough and the capacities are large enough that most, if not all, of the databases in the world can fit entirely in main memory. Main memory. So, but just because you're in memory doesn't mean magically everything's going to go faster. Just like a, you know, if, if you have a database and you make it distributed, it's not going to be magically uh, become super high performance. There's a bunch of other bottlenecks and other issues that we're going to have to deal with. So basically, because you remove disk from the equation, except for, for logging and recovery, there's some other things now rise to the top that we're going to have to deal with. 
Um, and again, that's what the, some of the major points we're going to talk through um, the semester, how to, how to deal with uh, these issues. So locking and latching doesn't, you know, still problematic that can limit concurrency. Cash line misses are actually going to become a big deal. Um, pointer chasing, you know, f doing multiple layers of indirection to find the data that we need is, is going to kill us. Doing a predicate evaluation, so if you, have a, if you say you're, you're running a query on a billion tuples, the where clause can actually become a, a big bottleneck. Moving data around, copying data between different layers is an issue. And then networking will be a problem for the, the communicating between the, the application and the database management system itself. And this is why people usually you know, look to using store procedures um, to overcome this issue. So some core numbers, important numbers to keep in the back of your mind uh, as we go along throughout the semester is the storage action latencies of the different levels of, of, of devices or storage mechanisms in, in, in a system. And again, on the one end of the spectrum, if you look at like a spinning disk hard drives, you know, every disk seek and, and, and write, it's going to be, you know, in the, the low number of milliseconds up, you know, up to 10 milliseconds for, for older drives. But now when you start going closer and closer to the CPU, the, the, the latency increases a lot. Or sorry, increase, latency increases uh, by a lot, right? So now, in the, again, instead of doing the 10 millisecond lookup to do a read when something's on a spitting disk hard drive, now we can do a 60 to 100 nanosecond lookup when everything's in DRAM. Right? So because of these numbers are so small, like this really changes how we're actually going to approach the database and, and ex execute queries. So there's a great... Uh, Great metaphor that Jim Gray always likes to use, used to like to use that I like to use in my classes that sort of describe just the order of magnitude difference in performance that we're talking about here. So you can think of like reading something in L3 cache is equivalent to like reading a book that's right in front of you in the room on the table. But reading something from a spinning disk hard drive is like flying out to Pluto to go read the same book, right? In, in this, the, so the, the, the microscopic scale these numbers may be hard for us to reason about but when you really think about it like these performance differences from from l3 and dram is quite significant than it's been this hard drive and therefore because we don't assume that we have to go out the disk it's gonna be really slow this allows us to, to redesign our system our database system and, and and perform better all right so, the, so what are some of the things we're, <clears throat> we're going to talk about through the semester okay how how things change in the in-memory database so first of all, we get rid of the idea of slotted pages um, because we don't have to worry about packing data onto pages on disk. Um, but we are going to change uh, slightly how we actually organize the data itself. Um, and they don't need to actually be you know, physically close to each other in, in, in memory in the same way they have to do on, on disk. So instead of having record IDs, we can actually use direct memory pointers uh, in many cases. We can split up the fixed length and variable length data um, and we may, may want to use checksums now to ensure that uh, the software is not going to trash our data. So the, it's not to say that we're not going to still want to organize our database still in blocks or pages because the OS is still going to do this. But the way we're, we're going to do it, it will be slightly different. Right, so to use this as a high-level example, say we have our same database, the same query we had before. We want to do a lookup on an index. Right now in our index, instead of getting a... Uh, a page ID and a slot number, we're going to get a block ID and an offset that we can use to jump directly to memory to go find the data that we want. And so there'll be sort of two sets of, of, of memory pools here. So the first one will be fixed length data. So think of things like, you know, 32 bit integers, 64 bit integers, things like that, that will be all contiguous with each other in memory, assuming that we're having a row store. But then anytime we have a variable length uh, attribute, like a var char or a large you know, text field, things like that, instead of storing the data in line with the, 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 the tuple and the fixed length data blocks, it'll just have a 64-bit pointer to the data out in some variable length data block. Right? And again, in a disk-based system, this might be a bad idea because now when you do a lookup, if you split up the variable length data to go grab a tuple, you may have to do uh, two fetches to go get the one page that has the fixed length data and one fetch to get the variable length uh, data. But now in, in memory database, we don't care about this. It's just a dereference to go find the data that we want. 
You may be thinking also too that uh, why even bother with a storage organization of a memory database? Why not just let the, the OS manage this with MMAP, memory map files? Um, and the answer is you can kind of get pretty close to maybe what we actually want um, to, you know, using using uh, hints like mAdvise and msync. Um, but in practice, this is actually not going to be practical. Now, underneath the covers, when we malloc a big bunch of, big bunch of memory, the OS is going to run MMAP for us to do that. But when but we don't want the OS be responsible for writing things out to disk for recovery. That all that stuff we want to manage ourselves. So there are some notable MMAP databases in the wild, or actually in the real world, that people have been uh, have developed. Um, probably the most famous one is, is MongoDB. Before they bought Wire Tiger in uh, a few years ago, they had a storage engine that was that was entirely based on MMAP. MonadB is a academic uh, analytical system out of Europe. Um, that's a column source system that uses MMAP. LMDB is the Lightning Memory Map database. Uh, that's a, a sort of in-memory key value store like Berkeley DB um, that uses MMAP. And then MemSQL uses MMAP for their uh, for their uh, column store system. At least as far as I know, they, they're still doing this. So what I'll say is that if you have the right data out the disk. And you want to do transactions on updating the data, the database. You don't want to use MMAP because the OS isn't going to not understand what the hell you're actually trying to do in the data uh, with the database. And you want all the eviction and, and caching policies to be managed by the database system because it knows what queries you're executing. For things like MonadB, for example, or MemSQL, they're using this for read-only or read-mostly data, and the OS is is not going to get in the, in the way uh, too much. I would say this is an ongoing passion in my life of, of proving that MMAP is a bad idea for your database system. This is something that we're working on here this semester. Um, so hopefully I have more to say about this. So basically for analytical workloads, MMAP might be enough. Um, for transactional operational workloads, you don't want to use MMAP. What do you think about this? MongoDB raised a ton of money and they went IPO a few years ago. Uh, they, you know, they hired awesome engineers, they could have done anything in, in the world in their new system to make MMAP work better, and they decided to ditch MMAP and went with Wire Tiger. So if anything, that's anecdotal evidence to show that MMAP is a bad idea. Right, again, the main takeaway of all this is that the, you, if you let the OS manage your memory for you uh, at the level we need in a database system, the you're just, just going to run into so many problems because you're basically giving up fine-grained control of, of, the, of memory. Now we'll see as we go along through the semester, there'll be some more than just allocating memory and deciding when to flush out the disk. The OS can be used to decide where to actually place memory. And again, we'll see that the, the database system can do better than what the OS can do. And the main takeaway from all of this is that the, the, the database system is always going to know best for your application because it knows what queries you're executing. It, know what your it knows what your data looks like. So this is something that... Uh, we just want to manage ourselves. We don't want we don't want to give up control for this. All right. So now again, going back and discussing what what aspects of in memory databases are going to be different than what's been done in a disk oriented system. Uh, the first thing we talk about is concurrent control. So because now we assume data is in memory, and therefore the cost of accessing that that data, uh, like a tuple, is going to be you know, it's going to be known in advance, right? It's going to be bounded by you know, the access to memory. It, the cost of going doing a lookup to go acquire a lock for that tuple is going to be the same thing as going accessing the data itself. So we might as well just go just go access the data ourselves, right? So in the disk oriented system, again, they had a separate hash table for the the locks and the lock manager. But now we're in some some of these protocols we'll talk about through the semester. They're actually going to store the locks directly in the tuple itself. So how we're in memory database is going to end up detecting conflict uh, can change. We can do sort of more fine-grained locking, as we'll see in the hyper system. That's going to allow us to have better concurrency control. But then we can just have coarse-grained locking, like in BoltDB or HDOR, where we're going to have fewer locks uh, that, you know, it's going to be less overhead for us to maintain those locks, but it'll limit concurrency. So we'll see as we talk about concurrency control, that'll be this sort of trade-off in deciding, um, you know, how much 
at what granularity do we want to have transactions to you know, incur conflicts and, and reconcile them? Right, again, I said this before, but the, the, we can actually store now the locks directly in the tuple itself, and this will improve cache locality, um, and we'll see that we can use compare and swap techniques to efficiently acquire locks on things in the ways that we, the ways that we couldn't do with a, a separate lock manager hash table. So the main thing that we're going to see with an in-memory database and their concurrent trail schemes is that because no longer is the issue going to be that a transaction stalls because it has to go, to go out to disk to get something, it's going to end up stalling because another transaction is running at the same time, trying to access the same data it's trying to access, and therefore it has to wait for it to finish. So this is a combination, again, of everything being in memory, and also that we have way more cores on, on a single box now, on the way that, we, that, that the older system didn't have. For indexes, we're going to actually change um, how she designed them to be more high, high, high performance for in-memory in databases. So we'll see some examples from the 1980s when DRAM speeds were roughly the same as CPU cache speeds, and they designed them, these designed specialized memory indexes that uh, could be better than what sort of traditional D plus trees could be. But what we'll see that is that the, the D plus tree actually works still really well. Um, and there's some techniques and tweaks we can do to make it work better for in-memory databases, but the, the high-level architecture of it is still going to be the same. And actually, the modern like lock-free data structures uh, that we'll cover later on, or latch-free data structures, these things actually don't perform well that well at all just because the overhead of, of, of redoing operations that fail because of conflicts tends to, to crush performance. So again, the way to think about this is that a lot of the techniques we learned from an introduction discord in database class will still be relevant to uh, for in-memory indexes, but it's going to, we're, again, we're going to tweak some of the assumptions we make about them. The other thing I'll point out too is like in a disk-based system, when you have transactions that modify tables and those tables have pages and you modify it, therefore modify the indexes, the system would actually store the updates for those indexes on disk because you want to make sure that if you crash, come back, you can rebuild, you know, you, you can have the index all, re all ready to go without having to read the entire database again. In the MRE database, they're actually not going to log any updates to the index because if you crash and come back or restart the system and come back, you're going to load the database entirely in main memory all over again. And therefore, you might, might as well just rebuild the index as you read it. And so this avoids the overhead at runtime of having to do the log changes to the indexes. For query processing, some of the strategies we're going to use are going to be slightly different. Um, sequential scans are not going to be significantly faster for than random access. It looks not in the orders of magnitude that it is for, uh, or not order of magnitude, but like the, the 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 significance difference you have from a you know a spinning disk hard drive doing random I/O versus sequential I/O. Um, so this means that we are going to have to change some of the approaches we have for how we access data. But certainly for doing uh, long scans on columns, um, the sequential scan is still is going to be better because we can read a bunch of data uh, that may be compressed at the same time. But one thing that will be different is that instead of doing the tuple at a time approach that we use in a, um, in a, again, a traditional database system like the Volcano model calling next, next, next on the, the query plan, we can... Um, use different approaches that are designed for the type of work that we want to execute on. So, and this is because now if, if we're accessing a lot of data, it's actually the function calls in the software itself we're actually going to, going to become the bottlenecks and not the actual, and not disk I.O. because we don't have that anymore. Again, so we'll see this as, as we talk about query processing methods or query processing strategies. There's, there's different approaches we can use because we're in memory. And the last one is for logging and recovery. Uh, because the right ahead log, we still need the right ahead log because again, we, 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 you know, the system crashes, we lose all the contents of main memory anyway. Um, but there's techniques we're actually going to be able to apply where we can use be, be more lightweight in what we actually have to log um, because we know that we're in memory. So, for example, we may not have to store undo information because we never have to undo our transaction because there was no dirty pages that got written out the disk before a transaction actually got committed. So that the right head log only needs to store redo information. So, and because we don't have any more disk pages with uh, that could get rid of the disk, we don't need log sequence numbers, so we don't need to maintain these things all throughout the system. 
So again, just like in current control, we can have more lightweight schemes because we're in memory. With logging and recovery, we can do the same thing. Right, for checkpoints, uh, again, there's different techniques we can use uh, that we'll cover throughout the semester. And the main idea here is that because there won't be any dirty pages, we can be we can so much stream data directly out the disk. Um, but we have to make sure that we you know we're not seeing torn pages or torn updates from transactions. We'd be a little more careful about how we actually uh, do this. But again, it's it's a more lightweight scheme than you would have to do in, in a disk oriented system. The one thing I'll also talk about real quickly, uh, we'll have a whole lecture on this, but for the most of the semester, we're going to assume that the, the again the database is beyond disk. Obviously, that's more expensive for some some workloads or some or for for actually most applications because DRAM is more expensive and you have to maintain you know you have to, you have to maintain power to the machine in order to actually retain any data. So there will be some techniques we can look at in one class on how to actually maybe bring back the disk in such a way that doesn't slow us down and while well, having you know just re-architect the entire system to assume the database is going to be on disk. So this would be a uh, something we discussed in previous semesters, but I'm pushing it to be closer to the beginning of the semester when we talk about storage. Again, the idea is that if we assume the hot data is going to be in, 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 in main memory and we push cold data out to disk as, as it's becoming less likely to be updated for OLAP queries, can we do this in such a way that doesn't slow down the entire system the way we saw in, in that pie chart? So again, we'll discuss this more. Um, for the bulk of the conversation this semester, it, we, we're not going to assume this, but I think it's important at least to think about and understand as, as we go along. All right, so with that, I want to finish up talking about uh, just sort of three in-memory databases that I think are notable to discuss. Again, these things were sort of early pioneers in this space. They're not systems we're going to talk too much about during the semester. Um, the... But I think it's at least it's interesting to sort of bring them up now and to sort of understand what, how do we get to the point we're at now. So we'll talk about times ten uh, Dolly or data blitz from AT and T and uh, P time. These other ones here, like Hana, VoltDB, Hackathon, Silo, Hyper, MemSQL, Blue, and Geode, these are all in memory databases that we're going to talk all throughout the semester. Right? We'll describe the techniques that we've developed uh, that are, that are being proposed in the context of, of, of these systems and. Some of these are, are academic systems, some of these are commercial systems, um, but they're all been developed or worked on in, in the last in the last 10 years. Whereas these these three that I'm highlighting here, they go back to the, the 1990s. All right, so probably the, the, the most famous in-memory in database, at least for the longest time, that the that you know when you say what's an in-memory database, the one that everyone names is Times 10. So Times 10 was developed by HP Labs in, in the 1990s. It was originally called Smallbase, and then HP Labs spun it out as a separate startup, and then Oracle bought them in 2005. So you can still get it today. Um, you can still still operate as a you know standalone database minute system, but Oracle now also sells it as a cache, uh, like a front end in memory cache for the um, for the Oracle database, like the the the, the, the flagship database minute system called Oracle. So. What's sort of interesting about uh, uh, Times 10 is that it was a multi-process shared memory database management system. So we're not going to see very many shared memory multi-process systems uh, this semester. Um, and this is because everyone, you know, now that threading packages have gotten good enough or, and, and standardized that there's no need to worry about, you know, how am I going to operate on you know, different versions of Unix, right? Everyone sort of targets Linux. Um, and you know the, the Linux threading model is is good enough for what we need. So back then in the nineteen nineties, threading packages you know it was it wasn't P threads or POSIX threads it wasn't standardized as much as they are today. So to make sure your system could run on different variants of Unix, you did you did uh, you did forking with multiprocess for to have different workers. So they were using two phase locking in, in a single version system. Um, and what was really interesting is that, of course, they recognized in the 1990s that, oh, memory is expensive, memory is limited. So they were doing uh, dictionary encoding, columnar compression for the database, even, even though it was meant to be a operational database system. So when we talk about compression later on the semester, we're actually not going to see uh, very many systems, at least on the OTP side, that are actually going to do compression, even though they're in memory. 
right? The, the compression stuff is mostly going to come up for the, the column stores or the, the, the OLAP systems. So the next interesting system is, is Dolly. Uh, it was then later renamed uh, Data Blitz. Um, I think this is still around. Uh, ATT developed in the 1990s to for like telecom systems. Um, so it had to be sort of high, high performance to handle like incoming data from, from phone calls. Um, I, I think it's still around. I, the website might be down, but it, it's, it's, it might be still be used in production, but it, I don't think it was ever really commercialized. It wasn't like something you can, you can, you know, you can download and buy from at and I think it was sure of shipped in their technical year. So like times 10, it was a multi-process shared memory system, um, that actually used MMAP for, for storing their data. And what I'd like about Dolly is that they were paranoid about their system being, the database being corrupted by bad software written by other people. So it was like this, it would be like this storage manager that you would link into your library and almost like SQLite or RocksDB again, and you can make a request to it um, and it would process your data, but it was still in the same address space. So if you had crappy software, application software that was then using their, their storage manager, that crappy software then sort of trashed ran, random locations in memory. Um, this could then end up, you know, taking down, you know, corrupting the, the data itself. So they would take checksums for each page and make sure that on every single read that the checksum was, uh, was, was, was always correct. And then if it found out that it was incorrect, they would go out the log and, and recover the page from that log. Um, so this is a lot of overhead to do this, but you know they were being trying to be super cautious about their data, on it, and I find that quite admirable. All right, the last one is P time. Um, I met the guys that invented P time uh, last year. I always thought it was P star time. They said it was a, it was just called P time. So this was an in memory database out of South Korea from the two thousands. Um, the South Koreans are, are very good at. At building in memory databases. Altabase is another interesting one that, that came out of uh, that came out came out of that country. Um, so the this is one of the like the the early in memory databases from the two thousands that recognized that you can redesign this how to redesign the system to, to get better performance than a disk oriented system for transactional workloads. So it had a lot of interesting aspects of it that are still relevant to today. Um, how they do uh, different differential encoding for maintaining log records, to reduce the amount of data you have to store for any time your transaction updates things. They could put support hybrid storage layouts, so you could have a row store and a column store in a single system. And they could also write data out the disk as for cold storage, um, which is, again, the larger the memory stuff we'll talk about later in the semester. So P time wasn't around for very, very long. They had some early benchmark numbers that were in, that was in a white paper that was pretty impressive. I mean, even, even still for today, for what they were able to achieve. Um, they were bought by SAP in 2005, uh, and then the code base was merged into SAP HANA. So when you execute transactions on, on SAP HANA, some portion of that of that system is actually the, the original P-time code um, from, from, from way back in the 2000s. All right, so to finish up, the, you know, this is kind of a wild, wild lecture, so I apologize for that, but the the main takeaway I want you to get from all this is that the the entire semester is really about how looking at how how data systems can be designed differently if you assume everything is going to be in memory. And we're at the point it's 2019. You know, this I don't it's not an issue at, at all now. Ten years ago, it sort of was where where people were not comfortable with the idea of having your database run entirely in main memory. Um, but now everyone, you know, it's, it's, there's enough commercial products, there's enough buy-in into this concept that it's not an issue. So the other thing we'll also talk about too is that the MMAP is a terrible idea. If, if I die, you can put this on my tombstone, never use MMAP for your database. Um, and we'll discuss more throughout the semester why this is the case. And this is ongoing research for us at Carnegie Mellon. All right, so... Uh, I gotta go uh, take a shower or go clean myself up. It's 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 a mess. Um, so next class we're gonna talk about uh, the sort of more complex topics about transactions than what probably was covered in your in the introduction class. 
We want to talk about different transaction programming models. Uh, Boydman is sort of the flat transactions that we normally talk about in, when we discussed this uh, last semester. Then we'll talk about isolation levels, and then we'll talk a little bit about modern concurrent control implementations. So the paper you've been assigned to read is a survey paper that I did a few years ago on looking at how modern concurrent control protocols scale to a really high concurrency or really high uh, core counts and to identify what the bottlenecks are on, on sort of future hardware. So this is sort of an extreme case, but the idea is to begin to sort of think about what, uh, how these, these systems could actually perform when you have a, a lot of simultaneous operations running at the same time. So uh, as I said also too, make sure you submit your first reading review on Wednesday before class, um, and then I'll post that lecture um, uh, later on. So at this point, uh, we gotta leave Reno um, we're going to head out of town and, and then whatever motel we end up next, I'll, I'll film the next lecture. Okay. All right, guys. Um, so with that, uh, take it easy. See ya. Got a belt to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle I guzzle because I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the pain I red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll run head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, so tell with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Isles.